From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis, codename Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. It's the top of the week. Uh, this is where my colleagues and I search the world, the outer reaches of the universe, and find some uh, weird Sometimes funny, sometimes fascinating, sometimes terrifying stories that maybe haven't gotten their due in mainstream media. So our stories today um, touch on the the precipice of ecological disaster. Uh, they touch on um, they literally touch on some delicate aspects of diplomacy, and uh, we also may spoiler alert do some magic like actual magic with a K, live for you, live for us, uh, somehow alive uh, in the show today. But I think... Oh, we're going to... You sure we're not just going to tap some swamps? Because, I mean, I could do that. I could get into that. Ah, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, What kind of deck are you building today? It's okay. It's one of those things that somebody who's listening gets it. They go, ha, 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 reference. And if they don't, it just goes right by. I I thought, I, are, you, are you just making a euphemistic <laughs> reference to my story that I'm about to do? Tapping swamps? Is that <laughs> no, a thing? No, but it does work. And I okay. didn't think about it that way. And that's gross. Yeah. But Ooh, uh, no. it was just a is MTG reference. Sorry. Yeah, they're in the magic. <laughs> yeah. But let's 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 start there. Maybe um, let's go to China, where there is, you know, you know, it seems like there's always a conflict between uh, the West and China these days. But this one in particular is uh, it's one you might not expect. Uh, people arriving at the airport certainly didn't. Yeah, it's because it's it's kind of a hilarious, uh, but yet delicate, like you said, Ben, um, example of how diplomacy uh, really is kind of this like super, super uh uh, tender uh, balancing act. Let's just say you can't say balancing act can't be tender, but I'm still going to stick with it. Uh, so you, I think we, we may have talked about, and then folks may have heard that um, in China, uh, they have leaned more toward a, a particular type of COVID-19 test. Uh, the Chinese government and, and their uh, scientists feel that it's more accurate. Uh, and it, you know, it does not, it uses the same type of swab that we use here in the United States. Um, the ones that you shove up you know, into your nose so far up, it feels like it's about to tap your brain, uh, and then gently rotate it. I, mean, I think many of us have probably had that experience, uh, self-administered. But in China, they stick that probe in a different place, and it's it's your butt, and um, that is how they've been doing it. And apparently, there's been some um, diplomatic kerfuffle around this notion that U.S. diplomats traveling to China are, you know, being, you know, when in China, do, do as the Chinese do, and that apparently involves sticking uh, anal swabs into uh, your anus or having that done in order to uh, be able to board that plane or or be able to get off that plane. Um, So there have been reports from outlets here in the United States of diplomats complaining to uh, have to go through this um, demoralizing procedure, in in their minds, demoralizing procedure. Uh, It's not all over China. It's just certain cities. But they have um, been using this, claiming that it can, uh, according to the BBC reporting, quote, increase the detection rate of infected people. Um, And China, it's interestingly enough, being, you know, what we consider the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic, has pretty much done a quite a fine job of bringing the virus under control. Many would argue a much better job than we've done here in the United States. Uh, So a uh, spokesperson for the Chinese foreign ministry by the name of Zhao Lijian has denied these claims, uh, saying that China has never required the U.S. diplomatic staff stationed in China to conduct anal swab tests. Uh, so, you know, w- w- what's going on here? Is this like a flex? Nothing more dangerous or terrifying than a bureaucrat with a little bit of power, 
um, you know, and maybe a little bit of ill will towards Americans. Perhaps that's where this is. It's isolated events of, of uh, you know, bureaucrats saying, nope, you got to you got to do the anal swab test, buddy. Um, or you're not getting you're not getting into the country. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. It's interesting that I love the fact that they're denying it, but yet there there are reports of of these these claims of these complaints being being filed by. Uh, I mean, not like it's official; like there's some kind of like you know official report being generated. But I don't know, guys. Uh, I, I I would like take it to the group here. What do you think? If I could just quickly, a couple things I want to talk about with this, and, yeah. and we can have discussion. But the the first one is that we know that. Your anus, my anus, everybody's anus. It's yeah. just the other end of this tube system that we've got going on in our bodies, right? Right, right. And one of the ends, yeah. <laughs> one of one of the ends, right? This is the first one. That's the other one. Um, we're, you know, culturally across the globe, it, there's a lot of taboo associated with our butts. Yep. Um, and scientifically, it's there's not that much of a difference. It's just the it's the uh, it's the out side, right? Right. right. Um, like and why it, spicy food burns on both ends? <laughs> exactly, because the cells are identical. Yeah, precisely. And and I don't, I'm not saying that I'm comfortable with anal swabs. It's like let's just let's do it all the time. I guess what I mean is, if there's a scientific reason to uh, to use them, then maybe maybe it's not such a bad thing. Mm. And according to what I've been reading. Swabbing there rather than your mouth, you have a better chance of detecting the virus because we we know that it collects uh, down there more. There's a, there's a larger chance of getting a positive if you have been infected. Mm-hmm. If you do an anal swab, if it's after the first week, that's the important part because we're looking at something time sensitive. So you could mm-hmm. you could still. Um, test negative, but be carrying COVID uh, and have a negative test with an anal swab. There there are a couple things about this story, the way it's been um, reported, that I think bear further scrutiny. First, it's not just the U.S. Uh, Japanese officials have been uh, subjected to this. Uh, Noel, as you said, it's not the entirety of the country of China. Newsweek's fact check rated it half true. Mm. Uh, the the primary question here is one of informed consent. And you can hear from the diplomats themselves or unnamed officials who I guess didn't want their full title and position being quoted where when they <laughs> complained about this. Understandably. Uh, right. The um, one spokesperson for the State Department noted that the, the problem for them was that their their organization had never agreed to this method of testing. They protested it as soon as they found out that some U.S. mission individuals were subjected to it. They protested directly to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, as did Japan, uh, citing psychological distress. <laughs> because, you know, we have to realize that some of these people who are being told to do this are the kind of people who are usually not told to do a bunch of things, right. much less have have this kind of test, which they, you know, several people probably considered undignified. Yeah, well, and, and that's a really good point, Ben, because this really is at the at the heart of this. It's a it's a uh, our discussion about cultural taboos, right? Like to to the Chinese, you know, it's like who cares? What's the big deal? It's a more accurate test. Why the hangups about butt stuff? And in the United States, it's something that people don't talk about. You know, it's it's considered kind of like super taboo or like you said undignified it's the idea of something being done to them uh that is uh, intended to um in some way cause them distress and you're, and you're right uh, vice world news did a piece on this a couple days ago or, or late last week and they quoted this um this statement that the state department never agreed to this kind of testing and protested directly to the ministry of foreign affairs like you said when we learned that some staff were subject to it um and and now we have people from the chinese government saying this never happened um, right. so I, 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 I'm not quite sure where this leaves us. Uh, but, but also, um, again, the, uh, the vice article, uh, the headline is China gave us diplomat anal COVID tests in error. American officials say, mm. yeah, well, the good news is if you are from South Korea, your government has a special deal with China. You can submit a stool sample 
uh, that they'll check instead of having the actual swab. So then it becomes like, what feels more awkward to you? Uh, someone you don't know <laughs> administering this test or handing someone you don't know a small jar of your poop mm-hmm. and saying, okay. I hope everything works out. I hope you're the right person. <laughs> Is this just a rando at the airport taking poop? <laughs> And if so, why? There do you have to do questions. it on site? Like, uh, do, you, do you bring it from home? Like, uh, so many questions. No, agreed. Yeah, so, so, so many questions. Wait, this is, this is, wait, I know you want to keep going. This is exactly what I want to bring up. Just let me know when you're done. I want to bring, I want to bring it back to this. Okay. Uh, another, I think a, a point that we do need to emphasize is the, the argument that there is some increased efficacy to the anal swab or the fecal test because uh, the World Health Organization doesn't agree. They still recommend respiratory tract testing um, because they give the best samples. They're mm. really worried about that week of when that week where there might be a false negative window. I see. That's interesting. Well, and, and it's also if you're testing up here, that's where it's really transferable, like the most transferable, right? With a cough or a sneeze or breathing and talking Depending on your lifestyle. Correct. But <coughs> the uh, probability is higher that you would infect others it, oh, like overall. Right. If you're if you're getting it through those droplets. Um, well, I, the thing I wanted to bring it back to you, Ben and Noel, was that we I, we just got a new dog from the shelter. Oh, yeah. And congratulations. I, I, well, mm-hmm. yeah, she's amazing. But I have to take her in to a vet immediately. To get her anal adopting. glands expressed? No. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a thing that dogs have to have done. I'm yes. sorry. I just found out about this and it's disgusting. I'm sorry I even brought no, it back to that. It's okay. But what I do have, what I have to do today is gather her poop up into, in this case, a bag and mm-hmm. take it with me. Mm. To to the doctor because it's one of the best ways to take a look at what's going on inside of her and a lot of health issues she may be having. Sure. So, so I'm just thinking about it in that way. Uh, I don't mean to be the advocate for poop testing mm. overall or global poop testing, but it does feel like that's not something I can't remember a time if I've ever done it. I don't think I've ever had a stool sample tested mm. from like a doctor or from just like a <laughs> from situation just a person. <laughs> no, from, <laughs> from a physician, but mm-hmm. like testing my gut bacteria and stuff like I'm interested to know because we science is leading us closer and closer to showing that our gut bacteria and everything that's going on down there is highly important. It's huge. It can also affect uh, aspects of your uh, cognitive state. Like the the fecal transplant uh, stuff you should know as a great episode on fecal mm-hmm. transplants. I highly recommend that to anyone interested. But the, the gut biome, which we've talked about in previous episodes, um, I think we are going to see some amazing research come out uh, in the near to midterm uh, regarding the, the potential, the medical potential of this, uh, both as a diagnostic tool and as a way to possibly treat or mitigate some ongoing issues that people might have. With that being said, you know, it's still pretty, it's almost like you could say it's where DNA testing was maybe 10 or eight years ago, right? Mm. And so there's not, to my knowledge so far, there's not like a 23 and poop uh, that'll help set you up with a uh, microbiome transfer uh, or analyze your own fecal matter for you uh just uh, how do you mail it you know what how does it work but um <laughs> 20 but, poop and pee it's yeah, just, uh, yeah yeah wow. yeah yeah <laughs> and street.com yeah uh the problem is i mean <laughs> i think one of the big points here is that we do have to ask how much soft cultural taboos stymie the progress of science Mm -hmm. or the treatment of disease you know like um it's also one of the first medical things people figured out as a species Uh, there are uh, medieval treatises aplenty on like a thing doctors used to do back in the day is they would always ask people for their urine or their feces when they die diagnosed i say their medical Mm -hmm. conditions and they would have you like urinate this was only for the wealthy people obviously they would have you urinate into a flask and they would just like hold it up in the light shake it around sniff it i don't want to be too gross but they did probably sip a little bit of it and uh and this would all be meant as a diagnostic tool or at least that's what they said so so the species is just better at doing something 
that it, it was already doing. This, this kind of historical context, of course, is a cold comfort to someone who has just been told they can't leave the airport or quarantine unless they um, make very good friends with this doctor. I, I wonder if it's like a situation where somebody was being unfriendly or a little bit aggro at the border and maybe someone used power that they didn't legally right, have right. to make a mandate. What do you think? The, that was my kind of theory, just the idea of some, you know, bureaucrat or some uh, airport worker flexing a little bit to make a point, <laughs> literally a point, uh, stuck three to five centimeters up the anus and gently rotated. Um, that Yeah, I, I did want to point out that the, the, the numbers there, three to five centimeters, uh, a lot less than is required uh, sticking that swab up your nasal cavity. So uh, I, I would argue this might be less unpleasant than the nasal test which is highly unpleasant uh, and makes your eye water. And it's, it really is a very invasive sensation. Um, You know, three to five centimeters up the butt. I'm fine with that. Seems like a welcomed uh, uh, relief in my book. Well, hopefully by the time international travel becomes the norm for people in the U S there will be vaccination of plenty and Mm -hmm. anal swabbing will be a, return to a distant memory. Yeah, exactly. an extracurricular recreational exactly. pursuit. Exactly. I'm it's my understanding now uh, is, or, you know, I may be incorrect. You guys tell me if I'm wrong. So we're talking about when anal swabbing test is most effective. It seems like it's good for testing. Like you said, Ben, as the virus is going through your system. So it's almost like late, late in the game, it's moving through your system because that that would make complete sense, and it would all, it would also make sense what the um, I think his name is Li Tongjing, uh, someone who was responding to this story, who who just said that it's generally used for people who are in quarantine. So like you're testing to see if this person is ready to exit quarantine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, because that, that there's there's that window of time where somebody could test negative on a respiratory test, right? Or a, a, you know, a nose swab, but they could still test positive on that anal swab just because of exactly what you're describing, Matt, the process uh, through which the virus propagates through the body. Hmm. (laughs) Well, indeed. Uh, I think we can probably take a quick sponsor break if no one else has any burning, uh, never mind, burning sensations. Never mind. No, no, I'm done. Sorry. I'm canceled. I did eat a lot of jalapenos and a couple of habaneros earlier, so we'll R- see. Wait, a lot of jalapenos and a couple habaneros? Yeah. You are a glutton for uh, punishment, my friend. But we're going to take a quick word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. <laughs> And we have returned. Uh, We're going to get weird with it, folks. I hope you join us for the ride. Let's talk a little bit about magic, not stage magic, not David Copperfield, uh, not mentalist tricks like Darren Brown. Again, highly recommended if you want to learn more uh, social hacking. Do check out Darren Brown's stuff. We're talking about something old school, something called a sigil. S-I-G-I-L from the Latin uh, for seal. And a sigil is one of those things you'll know it, you'll know it when you see it, even if you've never worked with this kind of stuff before. In medieval ceremonial magic, this term usually referred to specific signs that were kind of like, think about it in graphic design terms, they were like the logos of specific angels and demons. And the idea was that through interacting with these sigils, uh, the practitioner might be able to also interact with these uh, supernatural, divine, or infernal entities. And you would see lists of sigils in grimoires. Uh, One of the best examples, probably the Keys of Solomon, which has uh, the sigils of 72 different alleged princes of hell. Uh, And you would think of these, if you were a magic practitioner, as the true name of the spirit at hand. That's, okay, that's where it comes from, but sigils, the belief in them, uh, exist in the modern day. 
<laughs> it's uh, it's weird because sigils, like so many other things, may be evolving. Recently, I learned about something that I wanted to uh, share with all of us uh, today and then all of us listening at home. Occultists are attempting to take magic to the digital age by constructing something they call the Sigil Engine. Uh, it is a website that you can go to right now if you wish, uh, just sigilengine.com. And once you go there, what you'll see is a kind of spooky, all black background, red lettering, and one thing that just says, write your intention. And then there's a little menu at the top right that I highly, I highly recommend reading the Q&A before you participate in this experiment, uh, which we are going to try out online today. Um, well, not to volunteer you guys. I'm definitely going to do it on the air in just a second. Oh, yeah. I've got it up. It's a really pretty cool design. It's, it's very sinister, but like it's got just the red letter and the kind of these like rising smoke, little particles just drifting up. Uh, pretty impressive layout. I like it. So here's how practitioners typically use sigils. And there are tons of individual approaches to this. First, your idea is that you are going to create this sigil from scratch, channeling intentional thoughts. You know, I am a billionaire, says Jeff Bezos uh, decades ago while he's scrawling one of these things out. And through meditation, through this intentional thought, the concept for people who believe in this sort of magic is that you can imbue the sigil with powerful psychic energy and that in turn can influence events in, in a way. It's, uh, it bears some similarity to stuff like uh, The Secret but it comes with, you know, a little bit more ritualization. You would write down whatever you want to achieve. Here's how you make them at home. Write down whatever you want to achieve. So let's say, I'm just going to keep using the cheesesteak example. Um, you write that down, and then you look at the word. So the word would be cheesesteak. You take out all the vowels, so the E's and the E-A, right? And then you also take out any repeating letters and then you position the letters however you wish. Uh, they don't all have to be in a straight line. You can array, you can fuss with them, wh whatever speaks to you in the moment. And now you've got, you've created a sigil. And so you need to charge this with psychic energy. A uh, long time ago, Matt and I learned uh, that the creator of one of our favorite graphic novels, The Invisibles, resorted to sigils when he felt that his story was in danger of not not being fully published like there were sales problems he was worried it might just get canceled so he had he practiced some chaos magic some sigil magic and he asked uh, his readers to participate as well i did not because i read this years <laughs> after it came out same same yeah but uh the methods of charging are where you get to another kind of cultural taboo they vary. You could just meditate, like I mentioned. Uh, some people sing at their sigils. And most commonly, or very commonly, uh, people tend to pleasure themselves while regarding their symbols to mm. masturbate. And then after you do whatever your method is, and you feel like you've charged it up, you finally destroy the sigil ritualistically, or you forget all about it, and then you just wait for, you know, you wait for that cheese steak to become manifest through your will alone. Uh, obviously, this isn't something like everybody's on board with skeptics, yeah. uh, as you can imagine, object to this. But the people who do believe in it say that it works. It's just mischaracterized because you can't push reality too much. It has to be something that could be a goal that could be within the boundaries of your day-to-day -day life. Like, if you charge a sigil with the idea that you will win the lottery, you still have to buy a lottery ticket. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. that's the mm -hmm. idea. So Ben, I want to talk about this Q and a that you mentioned and what they say about possible ways to charge your sigil. You're saying all the correct things. That's my understanding of it too. The sexual release, the, the power that's that exists there is generally my understanding of how you charge a sigil. But they are saying there are other ways to do it mm -hmm. on, on the website. 
Can I read a couple of these? Please and, do. <laughs> okay. Um, it says it describes sex magic as one way to to charge it, and then it says alternatively, one could use other kinds of ecstasy inducing techniques. They give the examples of dancing for hours till you drop from exhaustion. We've all done that, right? Um, flagellation. So being struck. Uh, maybe maybe they're referring to self-flagellation sure. here, where you hit yourself or just being flagged. flagged. Um, also, severe sleep deprivation mm. as a way to to charge it. Now, that one it was interesting to me. I didn't... I was trying to understand how that would imbue it. Maybe the mania that can come in at that point after Ooh. severe sleep deprivation? Well, that's that's a good question. So sleep deprivation is fascinating to me. Um, we know that after a certain amount of time without sleep, uh, aspects of people's cognitive abilities decline, right? You have mm -hmm. trouble remembering things as quickly. Math becomes more difficult. Um, keeping to the point of a conversation or narrative is also more difficult. But I would argue, and I don't think I'm alone here, that you are encountering a trade-off because creative thinking seems to get kind of increasingly, uh, it increasingly bleeds into the waking world. So maybe that's part of the idea that you are closer to some creative aspect or closer to what I guess we could call A to C lateral thinking um that might that might be part of it but you're right it's all about altering the mental state in the presence of this thing so the you know dancing for hours like a dervish uh, religious movements have long sought these kind of um approaches to higher states or to the feeling of illumination but here's the thing the sigil engine is cutting out a lot of that work, right? Mm -hmm. And they're they're still giving you those um, basic guidelines, like you know, you um, will be better off not putting conditionality into your uh, into your intention. By which I mean, if you're making a sigil, you would write, "I have a cheese steak," not "I would like a cheese steak," mm. because that it, it kind of bakes in the possibility that it won't happen. Uh, and so what we're going to do today is we're not going to um, <laughs> we're not going to charge these on air, regardless of how you go about <laughs> it. It is it, it is a somewhat, you know, kind of a time consuming process, I would imagine. But well, what, I'm there with a the sleep deprivation. So if you want me to do a quick one, like that's fine. OK, great. <laughs> um, I am uh, I, I am on the website. I am going to create this. Yes. Uh, and I think you guys each already created one. I, I mm -hmm. messed around with this earlier for a few days. Uh, but I'm going to do one right now. And I don't know if it's one of those things where you can't tell people what your original, uh, what your original thing is. Oh, oh. for Pete's sake, don't misspell anything. Who knows? You yeah. Could, you could knock reality on its, uh, you could upend reality. All right. So. What happens, uh, we can describe this process. You have thought about your intention. You've realized that sometimes the universe's alignment could be described as lawful evil. So you're writing very carefully. After you have written your intention, you will see the website in real time do the... Um, do a version of that sigil construction. It's pretty neat to watch. You guys, you guys watched it as it happened too, right? The mm -hmm. vowels, the double letters get dropped out, and then you end up with a sigil. Would you guys like to describe yours? It looks like this kind of symbol that you might see used for like <clears throat> an electronic musician, like Aphex Twin or something, or like the game um, Half Life. Like I actually saved this uh, with the intention of maybe I'll figure out how to incorporate this into some musical project. It kind of looks like a scythe a little bit, but it's in a circle, which is makes what makes me think of the Aphex Twin logo. But it's like a straight line with a circle at the bottom, and then it crooks over one click, and then goes down at an angle, and then down one more click, and then has a flat little line at the bottom. Do I do I have to say what my intention was, or is that a secret? Like birthday wishes. <sighs> Well, it's uh, it's it's up to you. I think if you wanna, if you wanna share what your intention is. I mm -hmm. don't know, I don't know how much uh, that would impact the efficacy in this magical system. Uh, but yeah, maybe 
I, I guess the easiest way uh, you can tell us what it is if you're comfortable, but I'd also be interested in whether or not you you felt anything when you saw it. Did you see it and you go, yes, that's it? Well, it's kind of neat just to to add. The website shows you that process you were kind of describing, Ben. Right, like it yeah. takes your words and you can see the, the letters dropping off and then creating kind of these points and then they sort of populate almost this like Zodiac kind of vibe, right? Like it sort of feels like they're going into like, a, you know, a night sky kind of situation. The animation's really cool. Uh, mine was uh, I Am a Sex God. Uh, I just wanted something silly and dumb and, uh, you know, didn't really care if it came true or not. Don't even know what that would feel like. I don't even know what a sex god is. Uh, it might be one of those monkey's paw situations where if it did come true, I might not like it at all. Um, but yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you judging me there, Matt? No, no. I just want to, I want to, I, I'm deciding whether or not I want to hear updates uh, about how it goes with, with your intention and your, well, you have your to charge situation. it. <laughs> uh, that's, that's that's the thing I'll do, so, I'll do that in my private time later. so okay. as yeah so as i had said earlier it's it, it's cool to watch this happen in real time the process of it being um created and the uh the way that the the question i have is like how are they figuring out the points because you see the words disappear, or you see the letters rather disappear into these different points and these lines connect them. And it turns out that if you go back to the website later and you type the exact same thing, you're going to end up with a different sigil. Yeah, it appears to be a bit randomized, which is kind of neat, but it's giving you your own version of the thing you type in. Um, ben, I, I typed in, discover the truth about the 1947 Roswell, New Mexico crash. <laughs> I got a really great sigil too. Uh, squiggly lines with a circle. It's awesome. And and you know the one of the last notes here is that some people we're we're having fun with this, but some people, especially folks who take this stuff very seriously, have been offended by the existence of this website. They're mm. saying you know you're, that. you're taking a process that is. Uh, a real thing, right? And important to me or important to my organization. And are you gamifying it? Are you cheapening it? Are you miseducating people? Um, or is are there a lot of people who say my method is the one and only true method and everything else that you're doing is uh, ridiculously wrong and potentially, if people believe in this stuff, potentially dangerous, right? Yeah. It's like the idea of like a, a really talented video editor being replaced by automation or someone with a very like bankable skill, perhaps, or a very unique skill being somehow replaced by some sort of AI. Um, this is even more egregious because it's like, you know, uh, I could see how people could think of this as sacrilege, where you're taking this very um, sacred communication between uh, a practitioner and the spirit realm or, or what have you, um, and and somehow kind of, like you said, Ben, gamifying it or automating automating it in some way that I could see that being uh, problematic mm. for some folks. I love the, uh, <laughs> I love the uh, participatory aspect here. So I propose fellow conspiracy realists that if you are interested, should the spirit so move you, you hop on this website, um, make a couple of intentions, see what kind of sigils you end up with and uh, you know, wait Give it some time, and by all means, uh, let us know if you noticed something that you thought changed, right? And uh, if so, what? To the degree that you're comfortable telling us. Uh, as always, uh, what people usually say in these, these kind of circles is remember to do no harm because it can come back on you, again, if you believe this stuff. But I cannot wait. I cannot wait to hear what happens. I want somebody's like... And it, wouldn't it be nuts if um <laughs> wouldn't it be nuts if like uh, a few weeks from now after this comes out we get an email from like uh I don't know President Joe Biden or Takashi six nine I'm picking two very different people and they say like the entirety of <laughs> I became the president because I used this sigil magic or I um I uh, got out of jail. Because I used this sigil magic. Yeah. It wasn't really I COVID. I don't know what you guys did, but I got ethered the other day. Right. That's, that's what uh, Biden would say. 
<laughs> that's, <laughs> yes, that is a direct quote. Uh, everybody, remember, you, you see the weirdest stuff on C-SPAN. Uh, <laughs> so that's it. I, it's, this is really the beginning of what might be a longer story. I would love to hear people's experiences with this sort of stuff. Do you think there's any sand to it? Uh, yes, no, maybe. Uh, just let me know. Uh, so we'll pause for a word from our sponsor and we'll return with one more piece of strange news. And we're back. I, I can't help it. I have to talk about one last thing with the sigils. Guys, uh, Ben, you're talking about how some people have had problems with this. I love how the creators of Sigil Engine have in that Q&A this one statement. I'm just going to read it really quickly. It's for anyone who's having problems. It says, uh, number 10 in the QA, I am an archmage and I know everything about magic, particularly sigils, and everything you have done is wrong and you guys suck and I hate everything about this. This is real? Yeah, and it just says, uh, the response to that question is, it'll be okay, and it links you to a 10-minute mindfulness meditation, which is Ooh. really, really cool. Uh, now, I wasn't making light of someone calling themselves an archmage saying, is it real? I just meant that level of internet pedanticness is almost, like, comical. It sounds like a satire. Like, and I hate everything about this, and I hate you and yeah. your dumb face. You know, but I, I just love that they have a sense, not only a sense of humor about it, but they're also kind. Like, yeah, that's pretty kind. That is kind. OK, um, the next story, everyone, this comes from a CBS article that I just stumbled upon. And it was, gosh, it was several days ago now. I think it was on the 4th when I read it. No, it, yes, it was on the 5th of March. So about three days ago, as we record this, the headline is. A swarm of over 20,000 earthquakes has rocked Iceland in the past 10 days, and it could spark a volcanic eruption. So, uh, catching headline, of course, there, 20,000 earthquakes sounds horrifying. I remember when we read, oh gosh, a while ago, Ben, specifically about the swarms of earthquakes that were happening out in the national parks in parks in Yellowstone mm -hmm. and you know, the concept of a swarm of earthquakes feels horrifying. It's an image that you don't want to imagine in your mind. Um, and this is kind of the same deal here, but what we learned in, in that case with Yellowstone, this is a swarm of smaller earthquakes, very small movements that are being recorded. And then the, the thing that could be creepy about them is that, it tends to signal that there's going to be a larger like single event that occurs or you know, grouping of events where you're going to have a large magnitude earthquake. Yeah, that's uh, that's correct. It's also I mean, I, I think you're describing it in a in a perfect way, because if when you hear about large scale earthquakes, often those large like hand of God, natural disaster earthquakes, they are preceded. Uh, and followed by smaller things, some so small that you could not tell that they were occurring unless you were a seismologist or you happened to have the correct equipment to measure it. So then, you know, you would feel like it came out of nowhere, but that's that's not always the case. It is, though, and I think I know where you're going with this, even if they seem harmless, they can be indicative of uh, some terrifying stuff. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, we know for sure that there was a 2010 eruption in Iceland that wreaked havoc in the area. You know, a lot of people lost their homes in the local area. You know, it shut down air traffic both in Iceland and then in several places across the world because of the plume that was generated. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Let's just stay in the realm of 2021. What could this mean? What's occurring? So I'm going to jump back to that CBS article. It's where I started. It says that there have been 20,000 earthquakes recorded since February 24th. This is according to the Icelandic Meteorological Office. And they are saying that it's likely magma movements that are causing these tremors or these, you know, these small earthquakes to occur. And it is in a place called the R-E-Y-K-J-A-N-E-S. Peninsula. Anybody want to take a stab at that? 
sure. Rakian's Peninsula. Let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna freestyle it, and then we'll see if uh, I can find the actual pronunciation. But Rick Johns, Rick Johns, okay, is Reykjavik, right? Uh, that's what or I was thinking. Capital. That's 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 what first came to mind, right? So uh, we'll we'll go with that. Iceland, please write in. Let us know. Yeah, it's, I, I know some of you are listening in Iceland. I I see you out there. Really quick, I say there are far more difficult to pronounce volcanoes in Iceland. This one is actually pretty merciful compared to some. Uh, so that is very true. And I, you know what, for for this to talk about this, I actually have one for you that I can. Yes. I think I can pronounce. I was excited to see this, Matt. The 2010 volcano is, I think, pronounced Ayafjetla Yerkutth or Kutth, Kutth, something like that. We're back in the Black Lodge. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well done. Ayafjetla Yerkutth. <laughs> cream, cream corn. Cream corn. Ah, uh, oh, amazing. Um, you can read some incredible articles that describe Icelandic as uh, being created by someone that just was angry at everyone that in the future would attempt to learn how to speak it and write it and pronounce it. Okay, so we're going to jump back here just to talk about what it means. Um, There's a tweet that came out of the meteorological office out of Iceland. They're talking about a lot of this stuff occurring, and they said that the aviation color code for this peninsula is at orange level, meaning there's a heightened unrest and there is an increased likelihood of eruption. So again, this, you know, there's not only a worry for this kind of thing for the local area, just, you know, like we said, people would have to evacuate and they'd have to get out in time in order in order to not face death or, you know, destruction. There's also that worry the world across because Ooh. this could spell major problems not only for the aviation industry for air and soil and water pollution levels essentially because you're talking about a ton of particulate matter that gets into the air when there's a large scale eruption or essentially explosion of this kind yeah and you can look back at um you can look back through history and you can see a uh, the terrible correlation uh, between eruptions in one part of the world and inexplicably disastrous weather in what appears to be completely unrelated parts of the world. This gets really weird when we go far enough back uh, to, uh, to a time when maybe an eruption on a continent that people were not aware existed affected their continent. Like in the 1800s, um, this is not quite the same case, but in the 1800s, one of the huge problems with uh, some eruptions in Iceland was not just Iceland. It affected Scotland because of the reach of the disaster. Uh, so we see, again, anytime you're talking about weather or Earth systems, this is all interconnected. One of the biggest, I love that you brought up Yellowstone, Matt, because one of the um, most out there disturbing concerns uh about a Yellowstone uh, explosive event was not just that it could wreak havoc on the area of Yellowstone in a pretty wide swath, actually, but that it could somehow set off a domino, uh, a domino effect of several other similarly related events. So you wouldn't, you would accidentally buy a combo meal of natural disaster when you just came in for a drink. Uh, that's that's exactly what what could happen. I'm not suggesting that people are ordering these things to happen. It's just they're incredibly difficult yeah. to predict, right? Yeah. So sorry, you got a double whopper and some chicken fries with that order. It just came with it. <laughs> um, no, you're still right, Ben. I want to talk about the official word coming out from like the prime minister of Iceland right now saying that the country is well prepared. We're not expecting this to be a high risk thing. It's probably a low flow type of eruption that is being signals signaled by this swarm. They're saying that it's going to occur in an area where there's not critical infrastructure that's going to be at risk. It's at least it's nice to hear that. Right. But you can imagine if you're living in the immediate area, having this occur and knowing this is happening beneath your feet, it would be pretty disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there's, there's still so much science to be worked on in this regard. 
a lot of the science right now is is focused toward being able to predict things. Mm -hmm. I believe that that most people aren't going to say we're at the point where we can prevent things. We're just at the point where, to to your earlier uh, statement, Matt, we can hopefully get word to people in enough time for them to escape the danger zone. Um, Almost all volcanoes are independent of each other, but when you see the belief that... um, an eruption one volcano can trigger other volcanoes that can kind of be the case but sometimes they're part of a larger volcano complex that you just don't notice when you know you're a person running from their lives from one exploding mountain and then you see the mountain you're running toward also explode (laughs) yeah no thank you I want to read a few more things and then just give people places to check out if they want to follow this story Mm. Uh, the first is from Government.is, which is the official government of Iceland, and they are saying, again, a relatively small eruption of the type classified as a fissure eruption, sometimes referred to as the Icelandic type, is expected. Just putting it out there, keep that there. Scientists anticipate an eruption could last for a few days, up to a few weeks, due to the likely location of the emergence of lava, populated places, and critical infrastructure all this stuff are not expected to be in danger. It's exactly what I said before. just want to say that's coming directly from the government. And if you want to continue following updates from at least the official updates from the government of Iceland, you can head on over to government.is. That's the place to do it. You can click on news and there will generally be updates there that you can see. If you're on Twitter, you can follow the Icelandic Meteorological Office, or the IMO, it is at V-E-D-U-R-S-T-O-F-A-N, Vedurstofan. Uh, that is that is a place you can check that out. They tweet in, in both Icelandic and in uh, English. So if you can understand one of those, you're in a good place. Uh, and the last thing is the Icelandic MET office, the MET office, and this is en.vedur.is. And there you can actually find maps of where the where the swarms are occurring, where the earthquakes are actually located. Mm. And especially if you're in Iceland and you want to keep track of that stuff, that's the place to go. I also have an Iceland question for anybody who is a... Um who is a native of Iceland and currently lives there. This has nothing to do with volcanoes, I hope. I'm just simply curious. Is it true that uh, there is a an app, maybe a dating app in Iceland, that lets you know if the person you might go on a date with is related to you? Have you guys heard of this? I have not. Yeah, I've heard of the problem. Is yeah. it just what? Because I'm sorry. Is it because of population size, or like because of like literally the the gene pool of uh, I, of, I of believe Iceland? it's I- isolation over time and population. But of course, you know that's just my curiosity. I I am I am interested because when I first heard it, it sounded like a uh, onion story, or maybe a not the onion. Mm-hmm. It's just, let us know. Stay safe from the earthquakes and the volcanoes. <laughs> it also makes me think of Ask a Swede. Like, that seemed like an Onion article, too, right? But that, I loved it. I yeah, loved Ask yeah, a Swede. I'm yeah. so sad that it's gone. Yeah. It was it one of the only times in my life I've liked being on the phone. <laughs> that's, that's, I, 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 alas, I did not uh, get to experience its majesty. I think this also, Matt, I think this also takes us to another question, which is, are natural disasters of this sort on the rise? I did a little digging into uh, some work from seismologists and volcanologists, and it seems like, according to them, we're about with it, we're within the thresholds of normality or the usual amount of eruptions for 2020. I, I don't know about 2021, however. Yeah, I don't know. And also, you know, we talked about solar minimums and maximums and what effect that may or may not have on seismic activity and just, you know, all the other factors that go into what occurs beneath our feet on this planet. What I I love talking about that stuff and I love learning about it. And I'd be interested if you listening have any questions that you want us to ask that we can attempt to answer. Absolutely. And if you have some insider info 
on what's going on with those COVID checks in China, if you have the scoop on sigils, uh, if you can answer some of the questions that we just posed about Iceland and natural disaster, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Also, if you have something completely unrelated, especially a suggestion for an upcoming episode you think your fellow listeners would enjoy by all means, don't hesitate. Let us know about it. Uh, we're pretty easy to find online, unlike the pronunciation of that uh, one place in Iceland. That's right. You can find us on the usual locations in your social media feeds. Uh, we are Conspiracy Stuff on Facebook and Twitter and Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. You can also join our Facebook group, if you wish, by pointing your browser to Here's Where It Gets Crazy, the Facebook group. Uh, on Facebook, uh, and there you'll be prompted to uh, name a name or a series of names of people associated with this show. You can do that, uh, or you can just you know say a thing that that uh, will make Ben laugh or, or let us know that you're a human person that is aware of the show and you're in. Uh, and when I say in, I mean in on all of the best conspiracy realist related conversations on the internet. I'd, I'd love to see a sigil super thread over there. Please, I think that would be fun. You don't have to say exactly what your intention was when you created it, but maybe what it symbolizes. And so, I don't know. I would love to see that. You also don't have to be explicit about your charging method. As a matter of fact. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you don't care for the social meds, if they don't quite charge your sigil well, you can call us directly. We went legit a little while ago. We got a call in number and we keep up to date with it now. You can go ahead and summon us at one eight three three STD WYTK. You will have three minutes. Those minutes are yours. Uh, do with them what you will. If you want help with a little bit of a structure, then uh, try it this way. Tell us your name and or your sick nickname that you have chosen, your magical true name, if you will. And then tell us uh, tell us what's on your mind. If there's something that you don't feel comfortable sharing on air, but you just want to talk to us directly, that's fine too. Put that toward the end of the message. And most importantly, if you have a longer idea or uh, an involved story that needs more than three minutes to do it justice. Don't feel rushed. Don't feel like you ever have to censor yourself or edit yourself with us. You can just write to us directly. We have a good old fashioned email address for this. We read every email we get. Uh, we, as always, we can't wait to hear from you. So hit us up where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Hey, a fiatla your Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.